to compliment you on your kids' camp and having that number of children to go and, and you providing for that. Uh, you'll never know maybe how many of those may be the next pastor or next Lottie Moon that, that God may call out in his service. So uh, just I am so thankful that, and grateful for a church that cares for their children enough to see that they get to attend a, a, a camp like they went to. It's uh, very good. Also, uh, now next week I'll not be here. Be here, Lord's willing, the week after that. So uh, pray for me if you would. Now, I also would just want to thank you. Uh, I count it a joy and a privilege to be here. Uh, I am enjoying wor- uh, just preaching to you. You're a good congregation. You're easy to preach to. I don't know if you know that or not, but you are. Uh, I've been in some churches you preach, and it's just like preaching to trees, you know. There's no, re- no response or anything, but... You you are you hang in there with me, and so it's a it's a joy to share God's word with you. And thank you so much for accepting me like you have. Now take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter eight. Last week we looked at why I thought the Bible was true, and it's amazing. I just shared this with you. I went to the Creation Museum for the first time Tuesday, and I went down. And I thought, man, I preached high for this to First Baptist Logan Sunday. Because uh, there was about Nebuchadnezzar and, uh, and all that, you know, and, and the stars and all. And I thought, well, you know, uh, it's amazing. It's almost like just re- what you said is true, John. Keep preaching. And, uh, but it's uh, so now no, we know the Bible's true. Now let's t- see what the Bible says. Because sometimes when you come to an uh, instance like we're going to look at today, People say, oh, I just don't believe that. I I don't believe that part of it. Well, I believe it. I believe it happened just as the Word of God says. And and, uh, uh, and, and in this, God has some lessons for us. And I want us to learn those lessons today. One more night with the frogs. Exodus chapter 8. Take your Bibles. Turn to book Genesis. First book in the Bible. Take one right hand turn and you'll have it. Exodus chapter 8. New American Standard reads this way. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. And the Nile will swarm with frogs, which will come up and go into your house. Now watch this now. They'll go into your house and into your bedrooms and on your bed and into the houses of your servant and on your people and into the ovens and into the kneading bowls. So the frogs will come up on you and your people and all your servants. And then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the streams, over the pools, and make the frogs come up on the land of Egypt. And so Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt. And the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did the same with their secret arts, making frogs come up upon the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he will remove the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, The honor is yours to tell me. When shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people, that the frogs may be destroyed from you and your houses, that they may be left only in the Nile? And then he said, Tomorrow. So he said, May it be according to your word that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for your word. Father, we believe it is your word. We believe it has the power. It can affect our lives. And Lord, if we'll follow it, God, we can have happiness that, Lord, you just help us to, to see the truths today. That the, the secret of life, the secret of happiness is found in this story right here. So many people are seeking happiness. They want to be happy and they try so many things and yet just cannot find it. Help them to see today the truth. And I pray this in the very precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. 
Amen. Well, you know the story. The children of Israel were slaves of Egypt. And God raised up a mighty deliverer by the name of Moses. And you recall Moses was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. But he chose to leave royalty to be with his people. And God called Moses at the burning bush. And he said, Moses, I want you to lead my people out of bondage. And so Moses and Aaron, they go before Pharaoh. And they ask to let God's people go. And Aaron's rod was turned into a serpent. Pharaoh's magicians, empowered by Satan, did the same thing. But Aaron's rod, or serpent, swallowed up the others. Now we can learn something right there if we'll just pause a moment. That is this. Satan is very powerful. But God is more powerful. Because Aaron's rod swallowed up the others. Now in some scriptures it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Other places it said God hardened Pharaoh's heart. They go, well, that's a contradiction. See, you've taught like son. There is no contradiction. That's no contradiction. God hardened Pharaoh's heart because of Pharaoh's initial hardening. Now because of this, God showed his mighty power. Because of their disobedience, and he sent the plagues. You remember the ten plagues, water to blood, the frogs, the lice, the flies, the plague on the animals, boils, hell and fire, locusts, darkness, and death of the firstborn. All of these was an indictment, a judgment against an Egyptian god. For example... The Egyptians worshipped the Nile River. And anything that came out of the Nile River, they considered to be a god. So you can see again how, how this can affect the people as they see these frogs coming up. Now, so what today? I want us to take and look at this little story tucked back in the Old Testament. And I want us to learn some lessons that will help us to find the secret of happiness. Find the secret to fulfillment. It's strange that you would look under an instant about frogs to do that. But that's the way God is. God doesn't do things like we do. His ways are not our ways. And so, now keep in mind that by refusing to let the people of Israel go, Pharaoh was disobeying a direct command of God. And so God sent the frogs. And we read, we just read where they came up out of the Nile River and the ponds and the streams. And they came up by the millions. And they were in the slave quarters. They were in the houses, in the kitchen, in the bedroom. They were everywhere. Now I want you to use your sanctified imagination with me this morning. And I want you to just imagine. You go in your house, you've got to brush the frogs off the, ta- uh, off the ch- chair to sit down. And then your mother's in the kitchen. She's going to fix homemade bread. Wow. It's going to be a special supper tonight. Homemade bread. All the kids are so excited. And so she's in and said they're in the kneading bowls. So here she is. And she's kneading that, that dough and something falls over she turns around a frog and knocks something over she didn't notice it but a frog jumped into the dough and so she's still mixing it now you go into the go into the kitchen he says come family it's supper time supper's ready oh good homemade bread tonight oh boy and they all have to brush the frogs off the chair off their plates then they sit down and father takes this knife but first He thanks Jehovah God for what they're about to receive. And then he takes that knife and he cuts into that bread. And there's that old frog. Comes bedtime, you have to go upstairs and you have to brush the the frogs off the bed. And you lay down and they cover you and have to keep knock them off your face. You get up and you put your shoes on squash. A frog. They were ever. 
miserable, awful, terrible. And then just think of it this way too, the sound of it. Ribbit, ribbit, multiplied by millions. It, it was deafening. Now it was in the midst of this that Moses and Aaron goes to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, get rid of the frogs and I'll let the people go. See, he realized it was his disobedience. And in Burris' paraphrase, here's what he says. Moses says, Pharaoh, when are you willing to do as God says? Now think with me. Wouldn't you think if you was going through all of the little slimy frogs there, no, no isn't, you would have said, now, just get rid of them. I can't stand it anymore. Tell him get rid of them. But look in verse 10. You'll see Pharaoh's answer. Tomorrow. Do you hear what Pharaoh's saying? I want to spend one more night with the frogs. I want to spend one more night under God's chastisement. I want to spend one more night suffering God's punishment. I want to spend one more night with the frogs. I know what some of you think. Pharaoh wasn't very smart, was he? I wonder, are we any smarter? You see, God hasn't changed. Are you listening to me, folks? God hasn't changed. God's an unchanging God. God still demands instant obedience. Not to make us miserable. Here's the key. But to make us happy. You see, it is only through obedience that true happiness comes. We find here that it is because of the disobedience that they went through it. Hardly a day goes by, I don't hear someone say, I know I need to do such and such, and I'm going to tomorrow, or I'm going to next week. What are you saying? I want to spend another night with the frogs. I want to spend some more time under the chastisement of God. You're saying the same thing as Pharaoh's saying. Because, listen, God still disciplines us when we don't obey. So let's look at some lessons. Number one, the promise of frogs or the promise of chastisement for disobedience. Remember now, the plague of frogs was for Pharaoh's disobedience. Now, God hasn't promised that he'll send frogs on us. But he has given us some promises. He says to me and to you, if you continue to disobey me, if you continue to fail to submit to me, I've got some promises for you. Let me give you some of them to you. Listen to them. Proverbs thirteen fifteen. But the way of the transgressor is hard. Are you in a place where in your life that you're saying something like this? Boy, life is just so hard. Life. Boy, this life is hard. Oh, really? Could it be that life is hard because there's some area in your life where you are in disobedience with God? Because listen to it again. The way of the transgressor is hard. Listen to uh, Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. Are you here today and you think, Regardless of what I do, we cannot get ahead. We try, and we, I'm working overtime, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. We just can't prosper. We cannot get ahead. Could it be that there's some area in your life that you're in disobedience with God? Because God says, what? The transgressor, uh, he that, or he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. You see, you're covering that sin. You're thinking, I got this little pet sin no, nobody knows about. And, uh, and I'll just have a little fun with it. Nobody ever know about it. Well, God knows about it. And he says, you're covering that sin. And I will not let you prosper. The other week we said, 
be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also weep. Remember the law of the harvest? Are you sowing disobedience? And therefore you're suffering the chastisement of God? For whom the Lord loveth, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receiveth. Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. You go, Wait a minute, I thought God was a God of love. He is. The Bible says, whom God loveth, he chastens, he whips. It is because of his love. Look up here a minute. You were made to have fellowship with God. That's one of the reasons you are are here today, is to have fellowship with God. God loves you, and He wants to walk and talk with you, just as He did with Adam and Eve before sin. He wants to walk and talk and have fellowship with you. But He cannot when you have sin in your life. God is a holy, righteous God. And if He starts looking over your sin or condoning your sin, He will cease to be holy. He cannot do it. Even with his love for you, he cannot do it. So what does he do because of his love? He whips you. He chastises you. He sends that frog. He sends that punishment. Friends, listen. God hasn't changed since the days of Moses and Aaron. When you rebel against God, when you leave him out of your plans, you leave him out of your decisions, and you go on and live your life the way you want to live it, God says, I will, I will send the frog, or I will send my, my chastisement upon you. It may be sickness, it may be a car wreck, I don't know. God knows how to discipline his children. We have two boys. And I thank God for them. They're both very, one's a minister and the other one's in prison. Now, he's assistant, he's assistant warden, okay? <laughs> Just... Joel says, Dad, don't tell it that way. But I enjoy, I enjoy the shock effect, you know. Uh, but so one's a minister and the other's assistant warden. Very proud of them. Serving the Lord. But how two boys with the same parents, raised in the same home, can be so different, I do not understand. Jeff is academic straight A's, tops out. The principal, when I was a principal, called me and said, we got to have your son tested. And in kindergarten, he tested at fifth grade, fifth month in kindergarten. I mean, he just blow, it blows my... He gets it from Jeannie. He got it from, not, from, not from me. Joel, he's my sports. Great football player in high school, later coach uh, high school football, basketball, all of it. When they did something wrong, you know what I did? I would say, Jeff, go outside. Oh, come on, Dad. That's not that bad. I wouldn't send him to his room because if I sent him to his room, you know what he would do? Put headphones on, get a book. Man, he's in paradise. Joel, I say, Joel, go to your room. Oh, come on, Dad. You're being too hard on me. You see, they're my boys. I know how to discipline. And God knows how to discipline you. And if you continue to rebel against him, continue to leave him out of your life, live the way you want to live, folks, listen, you're you're going to be disciplined. He says, well, I don't believe that preacher. I'm living my own way and nothing's happening to me. You better start shaking in your boots or sandals, shoes, whatever you got on. You better start shaking because that tells me one of two things. You're treasuring up against a day of wrath, as the Bible says. Or as I said earlier, payday's coming someday. You're going to pay. The chastisement's going to come. The frog's going to come. You better get ready. Or... It's an indication that you're not his. Let's go back to my two boys. They're out in the yard playing. And there's a fight breaks out. There are about six or eight boys out there. Jeannie and I are going to call two boys in and we're going to spank them. What two boys are we going to call in? 
hers. <laughs> you see, they're hers when they're good. They're mine when uh, they're hers when they're bad. They're mine when they're good. See, so we're going to call hers and we're going to spank our too. We don't, we don't speak spank our neighbor's children. You don't either, do you? Shake your head no. Make me feel good. Surely, goodness, you don't spank other people's children. Well, God is the same way. God don't speak, spank the devil's children. And so you look over at your neighbor and say, he's a lost person. And look, and look how well, nothing ever happens bad. I mean, God doesn't discipline Satan's children. He disciplines his own. And listen to the scripture again. But after thy hardness and impotent heart, you treasure up unto thyself wrath against a day of wrath. In other words, you might think you're getting by with it, but you're not. It, it's, it's coming. My discipline is coming. I am going to whip you if you're mine. Well, let's hurry. Let's look at the second thing. The peril of one more night with the frogs. God has shown something you ought to do. You ought to be working with the youth. You ought to be in children's church. You should be in a, a beginner's church. Uh, you should be working with uh, uh, the women's Bible study. He has shown you what you ought to be doing. Or maybe there's some sin in your life that he's saying, give it up. Stop that. I don't want you doing that anymore. That breaks my heart. That's a sin against me. Stop it. Maybe nobody knows about it, but I know about it. And you're breaking my heart. Now stop it. And you know, I will. Maybe next week. I, I'm going to. I'm going to stop it. Or I'm going to start helping. Uh, just not right. You're saying I want to spend one more night with the frogs. I want to spend one more night under the chastisement of God. Disobeying God. Well, what happens? Number one. It's the peril of a wasted life. You see, God means for us to live every day in victory. When Jesus died on that cross, he said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That's the life he died for. He wants you to live in victory, not defeat. And so every day that you don't live for him and is a day lost for time and eternity, you will never have this day back again. When this day is gone, it's gone. And what you did for eternity is the only thing that's going to last. That's the only thing that counts in all time and eternity. So what happens? Life is like a vapor. It's here and it's gone. And so what happens then? You'll continue to say, God, I'm going to start helping in children's church maybe next week or next month. Or I'm going to stop that sin. I, I, I'm not going to continue that sin, but just not today. You're spending more night with the frogs. You see, days turn into weeks. Weeks, months. Months, years. Years, decades. And then your life's gone. Please listen to me. I, I know what I'm talking about. Let me give you an illustration. The man by the name of Ernie. I want to say where, where I was pastor at that time. His name was Ernie. He was Little League baseball coach, Pee Wee football coach, member of the Kiwanis, outstanding man in the community, outstanding man. His wife and children were members of our church. His wife came to me and said, Pastor, please go witness to Ernie. I said, okay. I went and I said, Ernie, and I shared Christ with him. I said, Ernie, would you like to just pray, receive Christ? No. Don't have time for that, Pastor. I said, well, all right. Just come to church. Because I thought if I can get him in church, Holy Spirit will convict him. And I said, uh, well, just come to church. How about that? Don't have time. See, uh, Sundays I, I practice peewee football. And, and um, et cetera, et cetera. Don't have time. Well, he went to the doctor. And he was diagnosed with cancer. The fast-growing kind. Why call crying and said, Pastor Ernie's got cancer. Can you come and visit us? So I went Share Christ with him. And I said, Ernie, won't you receive? You've got the diagnosis of cancer. It's a fast growing kind. Won't you trust Jesus? He said, Yes, I will. He prayed to receive Christ. He said, Now I'll, I'll be in church. I said, Wonderful. He never got enough strength to come to our church, but he was saved. 
the wife called me one night and said, Pastor, and it's about 2 o'clock in the morning, Pastor, they said he doesn't have long now. All the family's here. He's calling for you. Will you come? I said, I'll be there. I'll go to the hospital, and I walk in. All the, his mother and his wife and his children, all of them around him, and he's, he's struggling for every breath. And the nurse came in and said, uh, you better say your goodbyes. He's not going to be here much longer. And he goes, Pastor. And his wife said, he wants you. And I go over, and I listen to it. Now listen, are you, are you hearing me? He goes, Pastor. And I lean down because he couldn't hardly talk very loud. I lean down and said, yes, Ernie. He said, I wasted my life. You know what I could have said? Ernie, you didn't waste your life. Why, you coached Little League football and basketball and, and baseball and you're a, a Lions uh, or a Kiwanis member. And why, Ernie, you didn't waste your life. I couldn't say that. You know why? He had wasted his life. Because only what you do for eternity will last. And the only thing I could tell him is took his hand, squeezed it hard, and I said, Ernie, God loves you so much. And it was only a matter of a couple more minutes. He was in eternity. Please listen to me. Don't say next week. Or I'm going to sometime. You're no smarter than Pharaoh. You're saying, I want to spend one more night with the frogs. I want God's chastisement up on my life. I want another time of failure in my life. Well, look at the next thing. Scars in your life. You continue to say no to him. I will one day. I'm going to. You make scars in my life. I've had a young man ask me, Pastor, let me get your doctrine straight. I said, okay. You believe that when I trust Jesus, he forgives me of all my sins. Is that right? And I said, yes, sir. Okay. I said, why, you want to receive him now? No. He said, i got some more wild living to do. And then I'll trust him. But I will. Don't you worry about me. I will trust him one of these days. But I just got a lot of living I want to do first. You know what he's saying? I want to spend some more nights with the frogs. And I want to spend some more nights adding scars to my life. Look up here a minute. You don't hear this very often from pulpits. God is love. And God will forgive you of your sins. But nowhere in the scripture... Does it say he'll remove the scars? Nowhere. So yes, you can wait. You can turn your life over to Jesus. And he'll forgive you. But he doesn't say, I'll wipe away all the scars. It can lead to a scarred life. Third thing, danger of becoming a castaway. Says uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 27 says, But I keep under my body and bring it under subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. The most miserable person in the world is not a lost person. Right? I didn't get very many amens on that. Let's try that one more time. The most miserable person in the world is not a lost person. I try. Listen, there's a lot of lost people out there having a good time. They think. I submit to you, the most miserable person is a Christian out of fellowship with God. That's the most miserable person. They know they should be doing something. They know what God has told them to do. They know it. And yet they could continue to rebel, continue to fail to submit. And they are miserable. And then he says, become a castaway. You know, that's to a Christian. 
You know what a castaway is? That is when God will continue to say, I want you to help me. I want you to serve me. I want you to live for me. I want you to do this. I want you to stop doing this. And you keep saying, maybe next week, next month, later on, when I get my house paid for, whatever excuse you might, when my children grow up, I will, I will, I will, I will. will." And then that happens and you still don't and you still don't. You know what God will say? God will say, all right, you're a castaway. And you know what he'll do? He'll put you on a shelf. And he'll leave you alone. Well, you'll go to heaven. But he'll leave you alone. And you're going to be the most miserable person in this world. Because God will no longer bless you. No longer deal with you. He'll just leave you alone. Folks, you don't want that. And if you continue to fail to submit and obey him, that's one of the dangers or one of the perils of one more night with the frogs. You're going to say, later, 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 until you'll become a castaway. Well, the perils of lost rewards. You're going to stand before the Lord at your judgment and you're going to be empty handed. Because you, you didn't serve him like he wanted you to serve him. You're not going to have a soul winner's crown because you didn't share Christ with anyone. You're not going to have rewards. You're going to be empty hand, lost of your rewards. And then for the you that may be lost, the danger of the unpardonable sin. The Bible says in Genesis 6, 3, my spirit shall not always strive with man. You see, you can stand back there at that pew and we will sing a hymn invitation in just a few minutes. And you can grip that pew and say, I just can't go to the I just Maybe next Sunday. Next Sunday. Then next Sunday will come and you'll stand back there and we'll start singing the invitation. Oh, I just can't go today. I just can't look at all these people. I, maybe next Sunday. Next Sunday. You're saying, let me spend some more nights with the frogs. But there's going to come a time. You know what happened? You'll stand back there and we'll sing the invitation. It won't affect you at all. You've crossed that line where God's Spirit will not deal with you anymore. I was holding a revival in Columbus. The pastor says, Brother John, I want you to witness this lady. This young lady says, she's She's such a good lady. I said, I've witnessed to her. She won't trust Christ. So she's got so many talents. Got a beautiful voice. She's a beautiful lady. So we went there and she was. She's beautiful. She could have been a model. And she was going to Ohio State. I said, Doug, could I share with you some scriptures that changed my life? That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Did it with Fred, remember, and over in Logan, or over in uh, Waverly. She goes, Okay. Just, okay. And I sat down and I went through scriptures. And folks, listen to me. God has given me the gift of discernment. And I can, I can discern. I, I'm, I'm getting to this person. Not me, but the Holy Spirit is getting to this person. I shared nothing. I mean nothing. And I thought, I'm wasting my time. And she, she, Spirit's not here. So it came to the end. I said, Rachel. I thought, well, maybe you're reading it wrong. Give her a chance. I said, Rachel, would you like to pray and receive Christ in your heart? No. I said, Rachel, you realize when you say no, you're not saying no to me. You're saying no to Jesus. You do know that, don't you? Oh, yeah. Rachel. Don't you want your sins forgiven? Don't you want Christ to come in? Mm, no. I thought, okay, there's something in her life's keeping her from it. So I asked a follow-up question. This is what I usually do. I shouldn't be telling you my secret, should I? And I, I said, well, Rachel, is there any reason why you wouldn't receive Christ? And so I thought, now she's going to come tell me. She's on drugs or she drinks or she's got a boyfriend that's been you know whatever and so I just I was ready for the confession she said, no 
I said, why don't you? She said, Pastor John said, I went to revival with my friend. And there's that preacher up there, and he preached and said, I stood back there, and I held back of that pew. I wanted to go forward so bad, but I wasn't going to do it. And my friend saw that I was under conviction. And so she invited me back again. And I went back to please her. And that preacher preached such a good message and came invitation, invitation time. They started singing. She said, I held the back of that pew. I thought, I want to go forward. And she said, I was so under so conviction. I couldn't take it anymore. And I stepped out. And then instead of stepping forward, I turned around and went out the back door. And she said, I went out on that porch and I hollered, God, leave me alone. And she said, I have never felt anything since. What she do? Went over that line. Now, you don't have to scream out to God, leave me alone, but you can just keep Sunday after Sunday saying no. Then he'll say, okay. I'll leave you alone. It's danger. That's a danger. Well, what's the alternative to one more night with frogs? What's the alternative to, you know, wasted life and scars and unpardonable sin or, or lost rewards? Well, look at the third part. What's the alternative? One word. You can write it in there, capitalize it. Make it big so you never forget it. Here it is. Obedience. Obedience. 1 Samuel 15 says, To obey is better than sacrifice. Blessed is he that hears the word of God and keeps it. If you know these things, happy are you that do them. What things? The word of God. You want to be happy? How many of you want to be happy? Raise your hand. All right, rest of you need to see a psychologist. Blessed. The, the word blessed means happy. Now listen to it. Blessed or happy are ye to hear the word of God and keep it. There's your key. Obedience. Obey what it says. Hardly a day goes by I don't hear somebody say, I know I need to do such and such. I want to just say, well, do it. I don't, but I should. There is no substitute for obedience. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. John 13, 17. Blessed, happy, fulfilled. You women want fulfillment? These political candidates get up. Women, if you want fulfillment, you vote for this party. This They don't know what they're talking about. Listen to it. Blessed, happy, fulfilled are they that hear the word of God and keep it. There is no substitute for obedience. Prayer is no substitute. You can pray till your face turns blue. There's no substitute. Sacrifice in another area. There's no substitute. God has laid up on your heart something you need to do. And you say, but God, I, I just don't want to do that now. I don't want to go back in that children's church right now. I, I'll tell you what I will do. I'll put an extra $50 a week in the plate and let somebody else do it. God says to you, obedience is better than sacrifice. I don't want your sacrifice. I want your obedience. Or self-pity is no sacrifice. Having a pity party is no, sac- uh, is no substitute. You know what a pity party is, don't you? It's where me, myself, and I, we sit down. And we say, oh, God, I failed you. And God said, that's right, you have, John. Oh, God, I'm just not worthy. No, you're not. Oh, God, I'm just feeling sorry for me. The pity party. You know what God says to me? John, I don't want your self-pity. I want your obedience. You can have self-pity all day long, John, but it doesn't mean a thing to me. I want your obedience. Listen, what has God spoken to you about? I'm asking you. Now, don't say it out loud, but what has God spoken to you about? What is he saying? Something he wants you to do or stop doing. You got it? Everybody's got it? What are you going to do? You're going to stop it? 
and you're going to start doing it? Or are you going to say, well, not today. You're saying I won't spend another night with the frogs. I won't spend another night on the chastisement of God. I won't spend another night without victory. I won't spend another night without happiness. We sing this song, and I'm done. When you walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And when we sing this invitation, it's your opportunity to do what God's been telling you to do. And you've been saying, well, not this week. Maybe later. Maybe later. The day is the day to say, God, I'm tired of the frogs. I'm tired of a wasted life. Our Father God, thank you for this time. Be with the invitation time. I pray, God, you'll give each person the courage to make that decision you want them to make. And I pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.